Our subject for this session is entitled The Ceiling and the 144,000. The Ceiling is a very important work. It's outlined for us in the book of Revelation, chapter 7 and on. And we will look at that in some detail. And then later we will look about uh, the subject of the 144,000. Someone has joked that there are 144,000 different interpretations as to who constitute this group. That is, of course, an exaggeration. However, it is true that there have been various views held by loyal Seventh-day Adventists over the years. In recent years, however, there has been a move toward more unity on this subject. Mrs. Ellen White wrote that we should not be fighting over the subject, saying that those who were in the group would know without question that's in quotes, without question, when the time comes for them to be sealed. You can read that in her book, Selected Messages, book one, page 174. In this study, we shall look at the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy statements and find out what we can learn about this group. All of us are agreed that the subject of the 144,000 is linked in Seventh-day Adventist theology with the understanding of the sealing work of the last days. In Ephesians 1.13, Paul wrote about saints that were sealed in his day. This is a different type of sealing from that spoken about in Revelation, as we will see. When I was a student at Pacific Union College in California <clears throat> in the school year 1953-54, a retired theology lecturer talking to me one day said, I do not know very much about the 144,000, but one thing I do know, and that it will be a man-sized job to be one of them. Later we will look at the character of this group and we will see that the standard is certainly a very high one. In Revelation 7, 1 to 4, we are introduced to the question of the sealing work and the 144,000, in these words, And after these things, verse 1, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. That signifies north, east, south, and west. Holding the four winds of the earth. Wind in Bible prophecy signifies war and strife and commotion. So the angels are holding trouble back so that it does not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel, verse 2, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Here the angel that calls out to the four who are holding back trouble on the earth, to hold the trouble away from men because there was an important work to go on before they would let those winds go. In other words, they were to maintain peaceful atmosphere in the earth as long as they could and while the saints are being sealed. And I heard the number of them that were sealed and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then the verses go on from verse 5 and onward, names 12 tribes, and says 12,000 were sealed from each tribe. That becomes a little problem for some people because these tribes are tribes of Jews. And uh, some would think that it's excluding Gentiles. But some commentators have pointed out that the selection of these 12 tribes indicates perhaps 12 different profiles of people personality types or whatever that are to be sealed and there's a number of 12,000 in each group. In Revelation 14, 1 to 5, 
the character requirements of the 144,000 are described, and we will look at this aspect in the study a little later on. First of all, we ask the question, what is the seal? A seal is usually thought of as that which makes or signifies that a document is authoritative, that a product is genuine. We often link seals with laws, as when the king or ruler signs a law into operation and makes it authentic. When this is done, three essentials are required. One, the name of the law giver must appear. Two, his title must also be included. And three, the territory over which he rules will be specified. Now in Romans chapter 4 verse 11, we read that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had. Other texts show that a seal is a sign or mark of authority. See Daniel 6 verse 8, 1 Kings 21 8, and Esther 3 verse 12. In Isaiah chapter 8 verse 16, we have an interesting verse which tells us, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And some Bible scholars have said the fact that the law and sealing are joined together is significant. And so we can pursue that concept a little more. Thus the seal of God would be that part of his law which contains the three essentials that we have listed. His name, his title, and the territory over which he rules. All three of these essentials are found in the fourth commandment and in the fourth commandment only out of the ten. The reading of the commandments will show that this is so. His name, Lord in capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which in Hebrew is the word Yahweh, personal name of God. His title, creator, creator of the world and the territory of the earth, and in fact, the heavens also. And uh, his territory, heaven, and earth, the universe, all of it is his territory. The scriptures do tell us that the Sabbath is God's sign given to his people to show that they are genuinely his. We read this in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, where it says, My Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you that I am the Lord that sanctify you. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And verse 20, same chapter. And hallow my Sabbaths. They shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Here, these three passages of Scripture tell us, God is telling us, that the Sabbath is the sign that he has given to his people to indicate that they are genuinely his and that they belong to him. Some people have said that the Sabbath is a sign of sanctification, as if Sabbath keeping is what sanctifies us. But notice that the verses say that it is God who sanctifies us, not our obedience. The Sabbath is a sign of God's creative power, and this power is that which he uses to sanctify us and to make us like Christ. Ellen G. White's statements that the Sabbath constitute God's seal read as follows. The Great Controversy, 452. The seal of God is found in the fourth commandment. Great Controversy, 640. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God. And 640, same book, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God. Patriarchs and Prophets 307 says, the fourth commandment is the only one of all the ten in which are found both the name and title of the lawgiver. It is the only one that shows by whose authority the law is given. 
Thus it contains the seal of God affixed to his law as evidence of his authenticity and the binding force. The SDA Bible Comedy, Volume 7, page 970, she also wrote, Those who would have the seal of God in their foreheads must keep the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. This is what distinguishes them from the disloyal who have accepted a man-made institution in place of the true Sabbath. The observance of God's rest day is the mark of distinction between him that serveth God and him that serveth God him not. Again in volume 7, Testimonies 981, those who desire to have the seal of God in their foreheads must keep the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Thus they are distinguished from the disloyal who have accepted a man-made institution in place of the true Sabbath. Further on the same page she said, the sign of obedience is the observance of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. If men keep the fourth commandment, they will keep all the rest. And another quote from volume 4, 1161, she wrote, What is the seal of the living God which is placed in the foreheads of his people? It is a mark which angels, but not human eyes, can read. For the destroying angel must see this mark of redemption. Just as soon as God, people of God are sealed in their foreheads. It is not any sign or seal or mark that can be seen, but I like this definition, a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. Notice that God's seal is to be received in the forehead. This is the seat of intelligence. The brain is right behind your forehead. And to get the seal of God, you must be a believer in the Sabbath. By contrast, the mark of the beast, which we talk about also in the book of Revelation, can be received in two places. One, it may be received in the forehead by some who believe that they're doing the right thing when they keep Sunday. And then there'll be thousands who are not concerned about Sunday sacredness, but they will keep it when it becomes a law for fear of civil punishment. They get the mark of the beast in their hand. The seal of God is only received in the forehead. Revelation 14.1 says, 144,000 have their father's name written in their foreheads. In the Bible, name frequently stands for character. That's an interesting study in itself, which to make a study of Bible names and see how character is revealed in so many of them. To have God's name in our forehead means that we are to reflect God's character. Exodus 34, 6 to 7, when God passed before Moses, because Moses had asked to see him, the Lord proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord God. And he visited he listed, rather, the various aspects of his character. Thus, when God's people bear his name in their foreheads, it means that they are revealing his character in their lives. So now let's look at the character of those who are sealed. Relation 14.4 says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. In Scripture, a woman is the symbol of a church. So this means that those sealed are not defiled with the false doctrines of apostate churches but have turned away, that have turned away from God's truth. It does not mean that they are literally virgins, for we read in God's word that he sanctifies marriage. See Hebrews 13, 4, where it reads that marriage is honourable and the bed is undefiled. And you can read further on that in the SDA Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 8 to 6. Revelation 14, verse 5 for in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. That certainly is a high standard. They speak the truth at all times. Revelation 22, 11, He that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still, describing the character of those who will be sealed. And 22, 11, He that is righteous, let him be righteous still, he that is holy, let him be holy still. We therefore conclude that those sealed will all be keeping God's Sabbath day 
and will be victorious in their living and will reflect God's character to the world. Quotes from Ellen White in her writings on the character of those sealed come from the following sources. The SDA Bible Dictionary of Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 970. The seal of the living God will be placed upon those who bear a likeness to Christ in character. Early writing 71, those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Testimonies for the church, all who receive the seal of God must be without spot before God. In Testimonies to Ministers 445, those who overcome the world, the flesh and the devil will be the favoured ones of God who shall receive the seal of the living God. And in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 976, she wrote, writing about the setting up of the image of the beasts and the coming Sunday Sabbath test, she wrote, this is the test that God's people must have before they are sealed. In the book Heavenly Places, 335, she penned these words, are we seeking for his fullness, ever pressing toward the mark set before us, the perfection of his character, when the Lord's people reach this mark, they will be sealed in their foreheads. Then we read a character of those who will not be sealed. She describes some of them. Early writings, page 58. In these things, that is, reading exciting books instead of the Bible, I'm sure she would include uh, videos and films if she was alive today, being filled with perplexity and care, about what to eat and drink and to wear, I saw great danger, for if the mind is filled with other things, present truth is shut out, and there is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, 216, now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of the impure man or woman the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men and women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God. Candidates for heaven. Testimonies to Ministers 445. Those whose hands are not clean, whose hearts are not pure, will not receive the seal of the living God. Those who are planning sin and acting it will be passed by. Those who, while having all the light of truth, but are allured by sin, setting up idols in their hearts, corrupting their souls before God, and polluting those who unite with them in sin, will have their names blotted out of the book of life. And Testimonies to Ministers 446. Will the seal be put upon the impure in mind, the fornicator, the adulterer, the man who covets his neighbour's wife? The implied answer, of course, to that question is no. Holiness must be inwrought in character. That's a quote. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 214, not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. Now that gives you an idea of how high the standard is that God requires of his people. It is left with us to remedy the defects of our character, to cleanse the soul from every defilement. Not that we can do that on our own bat, but God gives us the strength and the power because he is the source of all power to make it possible. Note that Ellen White speaks of perfection of character, not perfection of nature. Many people become confused in this area. Our characters are imperfect in this life. While we receive perfection of our natures at the second coming when we are glorified, the perfection of character involves the choices that we make. Now let's look at the time of the sealing. Obviously, it's a, a message, the sealing message is a doctrine that applies to the last days of Earth's history. And we've seen already in Revelation 1 verse 7 that says the seal is to be applied in the time of the end. 
as angels are told to hold back the winds of strife, as we have mentioned a little while ago. While we receive perfection of natures at the glorification at the second coming, the perfection of our characters involves the choices that we make now. The time of sealing. The sealing time is very short, she wrote in early writings, page 58, and will soon be over. And then on page 43, she wrote, Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to wander. We are in a battle, a spiritual battle. Satan is fighting for your souls, for my soul. But God is all-powerful and promised to keep us true to him if we put our choice into his hands. Testaments from the Church, Volume 3, page 266. In the closing work of the Church, in the sealing time. So the sealing time is right down there at the end. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Comedy, Volume 7, 968, she wrote, just before we entered it, that is the time of trouble that's coming on the earth, we all received the seal of the living God. Then I saw the four angels cease to hold the four winds. Close quote. Imagine when they let those winds go, what trouble will break on the earth. There'll be war, nation against nation, tribe against tribe, maybe city against city, family against family, individual against individual. The world will be in a terrible turmoil when Satan is let loose. <clears throat> Ezekiel 9, verse 1 to 6, is a very interesting passage of Scripture when it comes to the understanding of the seal of God. This passage speaks about an angel who has the writer's ink horn by his side. And just before we entered the time of trouble, we all received the seal of the living God, she wrote. Then I saw the four angels cease to hold the four winds. The passage of Ezekiel 9, 1 to 6, speaks about the angel with the writer's ink horn, and notice that the angel is going around setting a seal on different people at different times. He holds, he was told to begin with the ancient men at the gate. The decree that marks the close of probation then is not the act of placing the seal on God's people. The decree that makes the close of probation is uh, not placing the seal upon God's people, but it is a decree that acknowledges that the seal is already on them. They are to remain sealed with their righteous characters. In early writings, page 279, 280, I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had received the latter rain. An angel with the writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done. The saints were numbered, notice past tense, numbered, and sealed. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He then raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. And all the angelic hosts laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration that we know so well. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. I want you to notice that the sealing work is finished before Jesus makes that pronouncement. The making of that pronouncement is not the placing of the seal on God's people. The seal on God's people is placed there before that announcement. And that announcement is acknowledging that it is already now completed. Great controversy. 613, notice this comment, this quote. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returned from the earth announces that its work is done. His work is done. And all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, it is done. 
Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. And as I said in the previous lecture, nobody changes sides after that decree is pronounced by Jesus. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 66, she wrote, Reference to our published works will show our belief that the living righteous will receive the seal of God prior to the close of probation. You get it? Not at the close of probation, but before the close of probation, they will be sealed. Well, now the seal is interestingly called God's protecting seal. So let's look at some quotes that highlight that aspect of God's seal. Revelation 22, 11 says, He that is righteous and holy will remain so after the close of probation. Psalm 27, verse 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. God is going to protect his people that have been sealed. The time when the plagues fall after the close of probation, they will be protected. Ellen G. White in Seventh Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1 and Volume uh, 7, page, 60, page 96, we read, The Lord protects every being who bears his sign. So God is going to protect his people. Early writings, 43, 44. I saw a covering that God was drawing over his people to protect them in the time of trouble. And every soul that was decided on the truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. Satan was trying his every art to hold them where they were until the sealing was passed, until the covering was drawn over God's people. And on page 71, those who receive the seal of the living God are, are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Jesus is working now as our high priest, ministering his righteousness to all those who will accept it and giving his beautiful sinless character by faith to us so that we can stand before a holy God during that time. We are now better able to answer the question, who are the 144,000? They are the ones who have stood the tests of the last days, especially the death test over the mark of the beast issue the Sabbath Sunday issue, which involves the refusal to accept Sunday in place of God's true Sabbath day, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. In Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 976, she wrote, The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. You might remember that in the previous lecture we dealt with the death decree. And this is the test that God's people are to face before they can be sealed. Those who are therefore sealed go through the time of trouble after the close of probation, and will then witness the second coming of Jesus. Now we come to the great question that many people have debated. Is it a literal number, or is it a figurative number? It is a fact that the early Seventh-day Adventists believed that the number was a literal one. It was easy to think then, along those lines when our world membership was very small, it appears that Ellen White herself seemed to reflect that in one of her comments in early writings, page 15. When debate became heated at times over the issue, during her lifetime, she issued the following advice, found in the Bible Comedy, volume 7, page 978. When men pick up this theory and that theory, when they are curious to know something that is not necessary for them to know, God is not leading them. It is not his will that they are to get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to comprise the 144,000. This those who are the elect of God will in a short time know without question. A former president of the North New Zealand Conference who was originally from England once reported to me 
that in the early days of our work in the United Kingdom, there was a minister who believed that when our world membership reached 288,000 worldwide, then Jesus would come. His theory was based on the words of Jesus found in Matthew 24, 40, 41. One shall be taken and the other left. That is, if only half of 288,000 go to heaven, there will then be 144,000 sealed saints. With, this, with our world membership now over 20 million and still increasing every year, not counting unbaptized children in Adventist homes, many are now thinking that the number must be a figurative one. We know that there is coming a shaking when many will leave the church, especially when the persecution of the last days is meted out. But we have been told that while some leave, many more are going to join us than leave us, so that we'll then end up with more than we now have. In Testaments of the Church, Volume 8, 41, Ellen White wrote, and the shaking occurs, company after company from the Lord's army will join the foe, and tribe after tribe from the ranks of the enemy, united with the commandment, keeping people of God. And I ask you the question, which is the larger, a company or a tribe? I'd suggest to you that without question, a tribe is much larger than a company. So we're going to lose company after company of those that are not genuine, are not prepared to make the sacrifice to be absolutely loyal to God. But those that join us are called a tribe. So if we've got 20, 24 million now and lose some and we get more than we lose, we're going to end up with many more than we now have. In the light of this Ellen G. White quote and the fact that our world membership is now over 20 million, not counting the children, those who are yet not yet baptised, most Seventh-day Adventist pastors and scholars are inclined to accept that the number is symbolic of a much larger group. Now I want to study a format in the book of Revelation that may help us to get a clear picture. In the book of Revelation, there is a literary pattern that John used many times over, repeatedly, to answer the question that may help us to answer the question as to who the 140,000, whether it's literal or symbolic. Again and again, John heard a voice saying something But when he looked to see what or who had spoken or what had been described, he saw something very different from what he had heard. For example, look at the following five examples that we find in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.10 says, He heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet. But uh, verse 12 and 13 of the same chapter says, When he turned to look, to see. What did he see? He didn't see a trumpet. He saw one like the Son of Man in the midst of the candlesticks. Different, but it was the same. Revelation 4, verse 1, says, I heard, or he heard, a voice like a trumpet saying, Come, I will show thee the future. And verse 4, Revelation 4, 2 to 3, following on, He says that he looked and he saw one sitting on the throne. Revelation 10, verse 4 and 5 says he heard a voice from heaven. When he looked, he saw an angel. Revelation 14, verse 13 and 14, he heard a voice from heaven again. When he looked, he saw one sitting on a cloud who looked like the Son of Man. And Revelation 5 Verse 5 says he heard an elder talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who could open the seven seals. And verse 6, next verse says, when he looked, what did he see? He didn't see a lion of the tribe of Judah. He saw a lamb slain on an altar. Different but the same. We will now look at what John heard and what he saw in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7 to verse 4, he says, I heard the number that was sealed, 144,000. 
But verses 9 to 14, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne. These are they which came out of great tribulation. These are those that have been sealed, you see. Many have thought that the great multitude and the 144,000 are two different groups. But it is the 144,000 that go through the time of trouble in the last days after the close of probation as sealed saints, according to Revelation 7 to 14. Clearly, this tells us that the great multitude came out of great tribulation. And since we know that John frequently used this motive that we have mentioned, we can safely conclude that the two groups are one and the same, and that the number 140,000 is a symbolic number of the much larger group, because there are not two separate groups that come out of great tribulation. There's only one group, a great multitude that no man could number. Therefore, the 144,000 and the great multitude be considered the same group. In this study, I have chosen to place the emphasis on the character of those who will be sealed more than on the number. There should be no dispute over that issue. No greater honour could come to a human being than for God to put on him his seal of approval and support him through the final conflict between truth and error in the time of trouble of the last days. That is why they are said to be honoured throughout eternity and go everywhere where Jesus goes throughout the universe. Revelation 14, 4, These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. They are called the first fruits. First in the sense of importance, not the first in sense of time. Often people get confused when we read about first fruits in the Bible. Not always first in time. Often the expression is first in importance and privilege. Testaments to the Church, volume 5, page 215, says, They are the exalted of the redeemed hosts that stand before the throne of God and of the Lamb clad in white. They are the group who stood or stand through the great time of tribulation at the end and remain faithful to God. And Satan throws at them everything he can throw at them including the death threat. But angels sometimes, like men of war, as we saw in a previous lecture, will defend God's people at that time and no one will be martyred after the close of probation. So whether or not we are among the 144,000, how are we living today? Are we striving to reflect the image of Jesus fully? We do our striving by surrendering our will to God and accepting by faith the robe of Christ's righteousness and allowing him to live out his life in us. May all of us do that, is my prayer. Amen. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.